Good afternoon, my name is Jim Conlon and welcome to our special uh, sports edition. Uh, as you know, we've been previewing and airing live on radio, live on air for the past coming weeks of our special rugby documentary called Global Rugby Legends, My Life in Rugby. We're speaking to renowned rugby stars from the Southern Hemisphere and the North Northern Hemisphere. So when we think of Northern Hemisphere, we think of England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, France and Italy. When we think of Southern Hemisphere, we think of South Africa, Australia, New Zealand and Argentina. And our guest uh, this evening is a... Uh, an Azuri sort of star, a sort of rise to prominence. He's probably the youngest, one of the youngest ever players to captain his uh, country uh, for Italy. Uh, he was moved to England, played a club career with England in, in terms of Gloucester in England, but 74 appearances for them, 10 points. And was guard, uh, these time at Gloucester, he was guarded as one of the best players in the world in terms of his role, in terms of the second role in Gloucester. He's uh, appeared for Italy uh, over his distinguished uh, career uh, so many uh, times. He was captain of the 2008 I Italian national team as well and uh, obviously played uh, in the 2003 uh, World Cup, made his debut versus Namibia at age 20, the one and only Marco Bartolami. Marco, an absolute pleasure to talk to you, sir. And Marco, in terms of Italy, I noticed there growing up in 1999, you played for local teams for Traccia and Narbona. Did you come from a soccer or football area where growing up in Italy, or was you come from a rugby sort of small patch? Because obviously, we know in terms of Italy, you have the big Rome area where you have Roma, Lazio, Naples, then you have Napoli, the north, then you have Milan, Inter, Juventus. So where does rugby start to, where's the heartbeat of rugby in uh, Italy? And did you come from the heartbeat of rugby growing up as a child? Were you in that sort of area? Yeah, hello, James. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I come, uh, come from Padova, uh, which is based in Veneto and uh, basically is a specific rugby area. Definitely um, is one, probably the most important uh, rugby area um, in Italy because there are Rovigo, Padova and Treviso which is the club I'm coaching at the moment. And uh, they're all big, uh, big rugby, rugby teams uh, in the Italian history. Um, so, you know, I've been pretty, pretty lucky uh, to born in this, in this town. My father was a former rugby player. And uh, even if there's a soccer team, uh, rugby is still a very important uh, part of the city and of the culture of this, uh, of this town. Um, but, you know, I grew up playing, uh, playing football as well, playing soccer, you know, on the park. And, uh, but obviously I had the rugby ball around my house all the time. And uh, I was following my father that, um, um, he was, um, he was involved with the, with the rugby team and, uh, he was the manager. So he was traveling with the team. And I still remember every single game I was very young watching these rugby games, until at the age of nine, I started to play rugby. And Marco, did you grow up in a sort of uh, a big sort of family? Was it a sporting family? Had you brothers and sisters that played other sorts of sports? Was it always a case that the Bartolami parents were bringing Marco and his brother sisters, whether it was a football field or an electric track or a basketball game? Was it very much a sort of sports oriented and mad family? And was was had your other brother sisters are prominent in other sports and go, went on to do great things? Yeah, not really, to be honest. Uh, especially because sports in Italy um, is not uh, we don't practice sport in schools, so it's quite uh, it's quite uh, different than uh, than UK, for example. Um, so if you want to practice any sports, you need to go to a club uh, in the afternoon and then uh, organize yourself with that club and find a way. But obviously, my father was a former rugby player, so I had the pathway um, to follow, even if I grow up in the countryside. So I was lucky enough to have a lot of space outdoors. So um, since I was young, I was playing basketball, volleyball, a lot of soccer, rugby, tennis, Anything I could practice on a, on, a, on a park, it was, you know, my sport. And different time of the year as well. When Wimbledon was broadcast on TV, I was playing tennis. When, uh, you know, the Football World Cup, we were playing football with my friends. Um, so I think that uh, that gave me the opportunity, you know, to develop as probably an athlete um, a little bit. And, and then I found my way, my way with rugby, even if, to be honest, when I was young, around 14, 
uh, my uh, my school duties um, um, just changed the needs. So I had to choose between following keep keep playing rugby or switch to basketball, which was uh, you know the other sport I was um, I was interested in. Um, so I was lucky enough, uh, lucky enough uh, to keep playing rugby and uh, and end up uh, you know playing uh, playing for the Italian team. And I suppose, Marco, you mentioned that uh, maybe 10 or 11 or 12. And we all know the role models of uh, the New Zealand players have to look up to in terms of past great players, and the Australians and the Welsh and some great Welsh players of the history of Welsh rugby. As a youngster growing up, a nine or 10 year old, were you, would you, did you look at rugby legends outside of Italy? Or was there any sort of Italian player that you all could look up to as a nine-year-old when you were nine-year-old that he was the probably big name. Was there any sort of person with that sort of aura and sort of class that the, the Italian young rugby fans could sort of follow and ch- or was it the big names of the, the All Blacks and Australians that you admired most? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, the reality, yeah, is that we look uh, we look abroad and uh, and uh, for example, David Campese played for my team in Padova, so I was uh, very young when he was uh, playing for for our, for our team, and he was a superstar. So that's why you know everyone was uh, was dreaming to become like, like uh, David Campese. Um, but apart from that, I still remember when I was young, I was watching uh, the Premiership on TV. And probably my first dream I can recall in rugby uh, was to play in the Premiership. And uh, you know, some some years down the line, uh, I make that uh, reality uh, to play for Gloucester and be captain of Gloucester as well. So that was a big uh, achievement in terms of uh, making a dream come true, uh, come true in rugby. Yeah. And in terms of secondary school, you mentioned that. What did the parents want you in terms of profession, in terms of schooling, academics? Uh, what sort of area did you feel that you wanted to go down in terms of obviously rugby at that time? It's the percentages are low in terms of you if, if you make it at international level or not. So what was the aspiration for you if ru- this rugby dream didn't take off? Yeah, till uh, till I was uh, around twenty two, to be honest. Uh, uh, yeah, I was playing rugby, playing rugby with the, with the first team, so it was quite uh, becoming quite uh, quite serious. Uh, but my my first dream as a child was uh, to become a Ferrari mechanic. Mechanic. So that's why I studied mechanical engineer at university, and I finished my studies with uh, with the engineer as well, uh, because my yeah my deepest uh, deepest dream was uh, to work for Ferrari, and uh, you know it's still my dream. So who knows? Maybe one day I will uh, I will have that chance. Uh, but that was the big drive outside rugby uh, that uh, that uh, drive me my my studies. And obviously, in terms of uh, Italy, in terms of making uh, your debut for the Italian team, you came into that, I suppose, when it's an era when Italy had maybe one or two overseas players. Uh, there was a Dominguez there, a fly half sensational sort of uh, player and that sort of time. And maybe Italy was trying to develop its players outside of the one or two overseas sort of players. And was that sort of, did you look at those, those sort of players? Did you consider them as Italians or did you feel that right there holding back your own sort of development? No, I mean, uh, especially Diego Dominguez was a big superstar. Play for Italy. He has, um, he had, he has Italian heritage. So you know, even if he was born in Argentina, we have a big connection with that country. You know, after the Second World War, there was uh, you know um, thousands of Italians uh, moving to Argentina and United States. So I think that's part uh, as part of uh, global world, to be honest. Um, but uh, no, I was, uh, I think I was lucky because. Um, when it was around 2021, 20, um, the old generation of Italian players that brought Italy in the Six Nations, they were too old, so they had to um, to step back. And uh, there wasn't much, you know, much number of quality players around that area. So we had, my generation had the opportunity to step into the Italian team and obviously take the hard lessons at the start. Uh, but the likes of Castro Giovanni, Paris, uh, Bergamasco, uh, myself, a lot of players, Mazi, a lot of players, we made our debut in, during that years, and then we pay off after four or five years. Um, so, I mean, 
competition, whether it's coming from the home growth uh, players or overseas players, I think is always important and, and, and very important if you want to get better. Uh, so I never saw those players coming to Italy and play rugby in Italy as, as a problem. Um, probably we, we took uh, the lessons from them, we learn a lot uh, and then uh, we make it happen. And Marco, you made your debut against probably one of the lesser nations in the world in terms of Namibia. And uh, at the time, Italy, when you uh, just starting off the Six Nations, was a, a tough start when it became the Six Nations. It was a few hard learning sort of years uh, for Italy before it became Doro. Did you look at those sort of games against the Namibias, the Tongas, uh, this sort of world uh, in terms of Zimbabwe? Did you start to look at those games as sort of games that you could sort of build that sort of confidence for the next sort of six nations or how did you sort of sort of those games in terms of did you feel that they were a level below you again that the, you needed a, maybe a higher sort of level to bring you up to six nations which you did obviously get to but in the earlier years um yeah winning is important but uh, if you win against poor teams it doesn't help you um to get better and perform against the best side so uh, I mean, uh, it's at times it can help your conf- to build your confidence, but then I think uh, uh, playing against the best teams in the world is always the answer uh, to get better. Sometimes it's tough because Italy don't win that many games, but I always say whenever Italy win a game in the Six Nations, it's against hundreds of years of history um, of these those countries, those older countries in, in terms of rugby uh, rugby history. Um, so we got to be proud and we got to be conscious that is a um, one win is still a big win uh, for Italian rugby because uh, we are quite young compared to the other countries in terms of culture. If you travel to Italy, yeah, you find a rugby club somewhere, but obviously football is, is everywhere and uh, is uh, on TV and newspaper, and that takes a lot away from the other sports. So that's why sometimes when you make it happen, some you make something special happen in rugby or in basketball as well, or in volleyball, it's a very special, uh, it's a very special occasion for Italy, and you got to celebrate that. And at the age of 22, you became England, Italy's youngest uh, ever captain, uh, and you sort of held that for a number of years, in, in fact, in terms of that captaincy role. Do you feel that a greater expectation on you and your shoulders, captaincy, Italy, to get those wins? There were so, so many narrow games against Scotland and Wales where you were so close on several times before you got that victory in 2004. Did you feel... After maybe 2002, 2003, that's, yeah, it's coming after the World Cup, uh, having that experience of the World Cup in 2003. I know you got injured against Tonga, but for the Italian team, did you feel that, yeah, we're getting closer, we're getting closer, and obviously it came to pass in 2004? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, I mean, if you don't like pressure, you can play this uh, this game, uh, you know, at the highest level. And as a captain, it's even more because... Uh, the performance of the team is on your shoulders and you got to find ways where you help your teammates to perform better, whether they need, uh, you know, a hug or an arm around uh, their shoulders or they need a push. Um, so I always embrace, you know, the challenge. Uh, obviously, when I was young, uh, probably I wasn't that ready and I learned my lessons as well throughout uh, throughout my career. Uh, but I always embrace the challenge, always embrace against the best teams, always embrace the pressure to be captain um, of, of my Italian side because the honour and, uh, you know, the expectation was uh, was uh, equalised by the honour to wear the jersey and uh, represent your country. Um, so as I said, listen, you got to love pressure to play this uh, this game. You got to love pressure to be a coach and, and, and you got to live with that, with the highs and lows of the game. And obviously, to lose your captaincy, you might as well lose it to a rugby world player of the year, anyway. <laughs> in terms of that, in terms of Sergio uh, Parise, uh, in terms of his development. But you mentioned that, and that 2007 Six Nations uh, victory away in sort of Scotland, that tournament putting uh, more than one sort of wins in. Was that the highlight in terms of the, that generation of you? You, you mentioned Bartolami, Castrovani. That 2007 Six Nations, was that the sort of the highlight for you in terms of 
that sort of tournament because there was two wins and there could have been many there could have been another one as well you were sort of close to maybe maybe finishing third or second in that sort of uh, tournament Definitely was a shifting moment for Italian rugby because then uh, the following summer we had uh, the World Cup in France, so very close to Italy, and uh, there was a big attention around the around the team and uh, the expectations uh, around the team, and that's you know that's had a lot of value what, what we achieved during that Six Nation, and then pay out in the in the in the years after after that year because uh, a lot of young kids grow up dreaming you know to become an Italian rugby player because we were, you know, we won two games and uh, TVs, we are talking about the team, newspaper, we are talking about the team, um, which is, you know, always, always uh, very special. Um, but, you know, it's um, definitely was that was uh, was uh, one of the highlights of uh, of my career. Uh, but the, my whole career, you know, I can still remember every single game I played for Italy. And uh, either I was captain, then I hand the captaincy to to Sergio Paris. And uh, uh, listen, if you're a true leader, you never stop leading the team, even if you are behind another captain. And uh, that's what what I tried, uh, what I tried to do to support Sergio, obviously, in uh, his new role and uh, and keep adding to the team because ultimately leadership is about adding adding to the people around you. And finally, for you, the sort of two questions, Marco, just to finish off. Uh, in terms of uh, playing against Ireland now, uh, in terms of your battles, obviously this is an Irish documentary. Was Paul O'Connell the sort of player that you admired the most going up against? Obviously, he came head to toe a good sort of few times in that, that sort of position. Was Paul that sort of guy that you felt that he had such a charisma in terms of leading the people around him in terms of the captaincy warrior. Was he a sort of guy that you love locking your horns against? Yeah, definitely. Paul was, uh, you know, a very difficult opponent to play against. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a number of players, to be honest. Leo Callen as well, you know, uh, former second row. You, you know, we had those uh, lineup battles all around the park. I played for Italy and also when it was in Gloucester, we played... A few quarterfinals against Munster and Leinster, a few games against Leinster as well. Um, so, you know, listen, I haven't win, won many with uh, with Italy, but I have won a couple against them uh, with Gloucester. So, you know, it's always, always a matter of uh, facing the challenge and try to be as good as I could be against uh, those giants of the game. And, uh, you know, the, the the respect you earn on the field and also the friendship uh, that uh, that builds, you know, during those playing career, then, you know, you find that uh, afterwards because now, we, you know, Paul is coaching Ireland, I'm coaching Italy, but we're still sharing ideas and uh, and the way we see we see the game. And the same is for, with Leo. Um, we talk, we chat a lot. We talk about, you know, his challenges with Leinster and my challenges in Italy. And and we share a lot of ideas and with the way we do things. Um, so I think that's that's the magic of of the sport we play. Yeah, and Marco, obviously getting to manage now in Italy with Benetton as well, being there sort of five years as, in terms of that. In terms of Italian sort of club rugby, what's the sort of a, a dream? Is it to get to make steps, get to Heineken Cup quarter final, mm -hmm. get to to have an Italian team within the next 10 years in a Heineken Cup final? Would that be the the, the dream of Italian club rugby? Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, two years ago, we won the Rainbow Cup and that was uh, the first international trophy that uh, an Italian team, uh, either club or national team, won, uh, won at the international level. So it was a very special moment. But it was only a small period, a small competition. And my challenge now is to build a high performance culture and winning culture where we can sustain performance throughout the year and hopefully make the playoffs uh, year in, year out and, uh, and the European final stages as well. So definitely that's my dream. And uh, what I'm trying to do is is to teach those lessons to my players and try to find a shortcut for them uh, to be more successful than uh, what it was as a player. That's ultimately what uh, what coaching is about: is uh, you know handing out the lessons you learn to a younger player that can make it happen uh, faster and uh, and sooner than what you did as a player. And finally, for me to you, Marco Bartolami, if you looked in the mirror and you saw 
a Marco, a 22 year old Marco Bartolami, and he's pumped looking back at you. And how would you describe his attributes as a player in terms of what rugby made of him uh, in terms of uh, a boy becoming a man? Um, as I said, never stop trying. So keep uh, keep facing the challenge, keep raising the bar, because you don't know where are the limits. If you if you don't give it a go, you know you never know if you're good enough or not. Uh, so that was uh, what I learned when I was around that age, and uh, that was uh, there's still still something that drives me forwards uh, every day. On that note, Marco Bartolami, thanks for joining us this evening to share your memories of a stellar career with the Italian national team, uh, with obviously with Gloucester in England as well, and obviously with back in Italy then with Erboni and Zebre, and now coaching uh, the Binet on team. Radley regarded his partnership with Alex uh, Brown there in uh, Gloucester, one of the best uh, in the world in terms of the back row in that sort of time between 2006-2010. Key member of Italy's most successful campaign in the, the Six Nations in 2007. Youngest person ever captain in his country, the one and only Marco Bartolomei. A pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you.